Hello, everyone. So, we are nearing the end of the semester, and kind of going along with that, we're nearing the end of our look at the Middle Ages. And uh, we've already looked at the Black Death and how the Black Death really kind of started the process of bringing feudalism to an end. We looked briefly at the Crusades just for the cultural and political impact they had. But now we're really going to spend the next couple of days looking at how feudalism and that medieval culture, that feudal culture as we would consider it, really came to an end. And what, what I consider to be the nail in the coffin for feudalism was the Hundred Years' War, which, if we're being technical, it's really more of the Hundred Sixteen Years' War. But uh, the Hundred Years' War, lasting from 1337 to 1453, over the course of this century, and the pretty significant uh, political, economic, and social changes the Hundred Years' War brings about, uh, it fundamentally transformed European society to the point where feudalism as it uh, had functioned during the Middle Ages was no longer really um, the viable option. It was no longer really possible. And we'll look at that uh, over the course of our look at the Hundred Years' War. Although the Hundred Years' War started in the 14th century, we actually have to go back to the 11th century to understand the roots of the conflict. Let's go. Okay, that looks better. We have to go back to the, uh, the 11th century to understand the roots of the conflict. Uh, and it's, the Hundred Years' War really has its origins in, a, in an event referred to as the Norman Conquest. Specifically, it's the, the, uh, the, the Norman conquest of England. This took place in 1066 when William the Conqueror, who was the Duke of Normandy, which was a province in France, or which is a province in France, uh, but William the Conqueror led his Normans across the English Channel and basically set out to conquer England. Hence why he's referred to as the Conqueror. William's victory in the Battle of Hastings in 1066 cemented his conquest, uh, where he overthrew the previous king and cemented himself as the new king of England. And basically, William spent his remaining years uh, conquering more of the neighboring smaller territories in England and just consolidating them and adding them onto his kingdom to create the notion of England as we know it today. But the Norman Conquest creates a rather interesting situation in England, where the Normans who were now ruling England were technically not English, they were French. This new line of English kings and their new higher-ranking nobles, the, the people who helped them take power and who were rewarded with land and title, were not English. They were French. So it creates a really interesting situation in England where you have the bulk of the English people being ruled over by uh, a f people who are French. They're ethnically French. Culturally, the Normans were much more French than they were English. They spoke French amongst themselves. And also, all of these Norman rulers, including the kings, were vassals to the French king. Remember, William was the Duke of Normandy in France. And when William became the king of England, he didn't just give up being Duke of Normandy. He was he still owned land he's, and had title in France. As a result of that, it put him in a position where he was also technically a vassal to the king of France. So, again, it's a really, really interesting situation where the king of England is simultaneously somebody who has sworn obedience and loyalty and fealty to the king of France. 
And if that sounds like a really weird and interesting diplomatic and political situation, it's because it was. In theory, William, as the Duke of Normandy, would have to do whatever the, the King of France told him, even if that would be against the interests of England, the country he was king of. But that didn't, that didn't really happen, though. It's kind of interesting, if you think about it, that the King of France never really tried to take advantage of that. Um, but here you can see the uh, development of William's conquest. So Normandy, the province of Normandy is down here. So again, this is France, but you can see it's pretty close to England. It's right across the English Channel. So the Normans landed in uh, southeast England, taking over this area first. And then uh, basically over the next 14, or not four, the next four years, sorry, I, I'm bad at math. Over the next four years, they steadily conquered more and more territory until they basically controlled all of England. Although notably Wales and Scotland remained independent for at least a, a longer time. Eventually all three, eventually Scotland and Wales would be conquered by England and form Great Britain. Anyway, back to the Hundred Years' War. So, um, that, interest, that situation where you have uh, the English king is a vassal to the French king, becomes a problem in the year 1328, when Charles IV, the king of France, died without a son. This is a big deal. In medieval culture, medieval culture practiced something referred to as uh, primogeniture. Primogeniture was a, it was the inheritance law that was used in medieval Europe. And what primogeniture states is that when a man, in this case, like when the king or when like a lord dies, all of his property will be inherited by his eldest son. And the intention here was to prevent land from being split up and divided up amongst multiple heirs, which would only serve to weaken the family's power and influence over the century, over the, over the, over the years. So in order to preserve uh, the family's power and keep their land holdings intact, the eldest son would inherit everything. So if you were a younger son, you wouldn't get anything. If you were, a, you, well, you might get some money if you were um, a son, but you, crucially, you wouldn't have land, which meant you wouldn't have title. If you were a daughter, you have some money set aside as your dowry that would go to pay your husband uh, when you got married. Uh, but for royalty, this is especially important because under French law, the crown passed to a king's closest living male relative. In the absence of a son, the succession, the successor to Charles IV was a bit more difficult to determine. His closest male relative was his nephew, Edward III, who was the King of England. If primogeniture was followed, if custom was followed, then Edward III would inherit the crown and become the king of France, as well as being the king of England. So, needless to say, Edward really wanted that, because again, not only would you get to be the king of England, you'd get to be the king of France. Effectively, he'd be king of the two most powerful countries, or at least two of the most powerful countries in Western Europe. The French nobility, however, did not like this. The French nobility uh, did not want to be ruled over by an Englishman. At this point in time, uh, the, the English nobility had diverged enough from being French that the French nobles no longer, the French no longer viewed them as being French. 
uh, viewed them as being English. And the French wanted to be ruled over by a Frenchman. So the, the so even though the closest relative to Charles IV was his nephew, Edward III, the nobility backed his cousin, Philip IV. Uh, because even though he was a bit more distantly related to him, he was at least French. And because he had the support of the nobility, Philip IV was crowned the next king of France. And then Philip decided to make, or Philip made some really just bad decisions, at least in hindsight. These turned out to be really, really, really bad decisions uh, because all they did was anger the English. After becoming the king of France, Philip wanted to remove the possibility of the English king or an Englishman becoming the king of France. So to do that, he started seizing Edward's French territory. The mindset being, well, he won't, he can't have a claim on the throne if he doesn't have any standing in France. If we take away all his French territory and we take away all his title, then he's technically not French anymore and he can't inherit it. So Edward was angry at having his territory in France seized by Philip. But he couldn't really do anything about it because at that point in time, Edward was busy fighting a war with Scotland, trying to conquer the Scots. And Philip, in another attempt to uh, just kind of be petty and antagonize the English and try to knock England down a peg, uh, gave aid to the Scots in their war against the English. The Scots ultimately managed to fend off this, but Edward was mad. Edward got really mad. And after concluding his war against Scotland in 1340, Edward III decided he was going to uh, stake, uh, reinstate his claim to the French throne, and he led an invasion of France. Touching off the Hundred Years' War. But just to put names to faces, and or faces to names, uh, and just give you an idea of who the major players are. So here you have Charles IV, who was the King of France, who died without an heir. You have Edward III, the King of England, who was Charles' nephew, who technically had the closest claim, or had claim to the throne because he was his nephew, and by that, uh, through that, he was his closest living male relative. And then here you have Philip IV, who was Charles' cousin, who became his successor uh, because he had the support of the French nobility. So Charles IV, or not Charles, Philip IV, sorry, Philip IV becoming the king of France. Uh. And Edward, anyway, so Edward invades France after being antagonized by Philip and uh, basically reinstates his claim and says that he intends to take the French throne. And initially, his invasion works really well. Um, the English conquered most of northern France. They conquered the southern province here around Bordeaux. And furthermore, a couple of French provinces, notably the province of Burgundy, openly sided with the English. There were some members of the French nobility who were dissatisfied with Philip being their king and decided instead to uh, ally themselves with the English, hoping that if the English won, Edward would reward them by giving them a higher title and more land. Uh... Didn't, didn't really happen that way, as we'll find out later on. But anyway, here you see the French, even after losing a lot of territory, the French did effectively manage to halt the English advance and hold the line. But this situation, it was effectively a stalemate with uh, English losses of territory and the English regaining territory and the French losing territory and the regaining territory. And this situation pretty much yo-yoed like that 
for the next hundred or so years. There were a couple breaks in the fighting, uh, the longest break being during the outbreak of the Black Death. So roughly from the years uh, 1347 to the mid-1350s, uh, all fighting effectively stopped because of the Black Death running rampant. But, but um, after the Black Death, fighting began or picked up in earnest. A major reason for the English success in battle, and also a major, and this really doesn't seem like it would be that important, but this really was, this really was a really important uh, facet of this war that really did help undermine the system of feudalism was the introduction of the longbow. Uh, so the English first encountered opponents wielding longbows during their conquest of Wales. And they realized that these things were actually pretty useful. And so the English were the first major European country to introduce longbows and, and make widespread use of longbows in combat. The longbow had a number of advantages that radically changed the way warfare was fought. And kind of because of the way it changed warfare, it also radically transformed and, uh, and impacted the system of feudalism, which again is really weird because you generally wouldn't think of like a longbow, something like the longbow being something that could uh, undermine feudalism, but it did. So when looking at the advantages of the longbow, the longbow was not the first ranged weapon used in warfare. Uh, medieval warfare already had short bows and they had crossbows. But they each had weaknesses. Uh, the short bow, as its name might suggest, its major weakness was its range. Uh, it did not have enough range to be used effectively from long range. And furthermore, it didn't. It lacked sufficient power to penetrate heavy armor, which is what all the knights would be wearing. So the short bow was effectively useless against armored opponents such as knights. The other major ranged weapon, the crossbow, did have the power to penetrate heavy armor, and it did have sufficient range, but the problem was it took, a, it took way too long to reload. So crossbows were really only effective during sieges when uh, it, their wielders were effectively high up, and there was no possible way for their opponents to get near them. Uh, that way they would have time to basically reload without having to worry about being attacked. The longbow, however, addressed both of these weaknesses. The longbow was, as its name suggests, of substantially, it offered substantially greater range than the shortbow, allowing archers to uh, remain at a safe distance from their targets. Furthermore, the longbow had sufficient power to penetrate heavy armor. So the longbow allowed archers to be viable against knights, basically, and heavy, and heavy armored uh, melee fighters. Furthermore, the longbow was really cheap to make. It was pretty simple to make, and it didn't require a lot of training to learn how to use and for lack of a better term, get good at. So what the longbow does, it radically transforms the way the English start fighting and kind of the way the rest of Europe starts fighting when they realize that the English have this advantage and they start copying it. Uh, what it does is it changes the composition of their armies. Since the longbow was so cheap and easy to make, it was really easy to make a lot of them. And since it was so easy to train to use, it, it was easy to mass distribute to soldiers. And furthermore, it allowed soldiers to be effective in combat without the years and resources spent on training for knights. Uh, 
During the medieval era, knights were the ultimate warrior, which was kind of their purpose. They spent 14 years training in pretty much all aspects of combat. They were incredibly skilled and dangerous opponents, and really the only people who stood a chance at fighting knights and actually defeating a knight was another knight. However, the main weaknesses of knights were they took a lot it took a long time for them to go through all the training to be good. And it also was really, really expensive. All that heavy armor and all that, all those equipment and all the horses they would have, that was a lot of money. So uh, one, there weren't a lot of knights to begin with. Knights were specialized units. And two, they were too expensive and required too much training for kings to oversee the tra their training by themselves. To that end, they required the nobility to train them and pay for and basically pay for the cost of their training and their equipment. But with the longbow, it's arguably even more effective than knights, because it was a hard counter to knights, but it was cheaper and quicker. So the the knights effectively lose the knights knights effectively become obsolete in warfare because a single peasant with a longbow who spent a week training with it could easily take down a knight now. So knights were gradually abandoned after this just because they weren't effective and they weren't worth the cost of uh funding. So what this does is this radically weakens the power and the importance of the nobility because the king no longer needs the nobility to pay for the military. The king, since longbows are cheaper and easier to train, the king could fund this training themselves or himself. This also radically uh, altered the structure of the military by including a lot of peasants and making peasants a viable fighting, so fighting force. Uh, anyway, uh, so the prime example of the English use of the longbow proving pivotal is their victory in the uh, their victory in the Battle of Agincourt where they were radically outnumbered, and yet they had a lot of archers with longbows, and the French army was primarily heavily armored opponents, and the English just slaughtered them. It was a bloodbath. Uh, the French were just easily, easily beaten, even though they radically outnumbered the English. So I, I know I'm talking about the longbow a lot, but it's because the longbow was such a big deal. The longbow really did fundamentally change the structure of feudalism. It increased the power of kings and it decreased the power of the nobility and the knights by making the knights obsolete and by allowing the king, by basically removing the king's need for the nobles. Anyway, off of that tangent of the longo, uh, in 1356, this is arguably the low point for the French when uh, John II, who was the new king of France, that's another thing that's kind of crazy about the Hundred Years' War, by the way, is that uh, the guys who started it, like Edward III and, Char and or Philip IV, they they were dead by the time, like they were long dead by the time the war was finished. So, like, <laughs> I, I, it, it, it's just kind of crazy to see how so many kings just kept fighting this war. And as we'll see at the end, really for kind of nothing, but, you know, I digress. Anyway, so uh, the English victory in the Battle of Poitiers uh, oh, ends with them capturing the King of France, John II, which effectively allows the, gives, uh, allows the English to put a, a puppet king on the throne of France. This does not, however, cause the remainder of the French to surrender. The remaining French nobility still fought on, 
and still argued that the English king was illegitimate. But things didn't really start turning around for the French until 1429 when Joan of Arc comes on the scene. So 1429, Joan of Arc was a peasant girl who in her, as a teenager, Joan uh, claimed that she was receiving visions from God and being spoken to by God, who was telling her that she needed to help defeat the English and restore French rule over all of France. So to that end, Joan donned a suit of armor and basically wound up fighting with the French. And the French were desperate enough that they didn't really do anything about it. Uh, but Joan proved to be a really important figure. And more than that, a real important spark of inspiration and hope for the French when... In 1429, she successfully led a French counterattack at the Battle of Orléans and really started to finally break through the English lines and start pushing the English back out of France. And it's because of Joan's successes that the French were able to crown a new king, Charles VII, who was not an English puppet. And it was, again, all because of Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc serving as this inspiration to the French uh, to continue resisting the English. Oh, wait. Wrong computer. Sorry. Joan did not really get a good reward for this, however. Uh, she was eventually captured by the English, who were... Uh, understandably a bit angry at Joan uh, revitalizing the French military effort. So after being captured by the English, uh, and this is honestly kind of, uh, it reflects the culture of the time, um, Joan was accused of witchcraft, uh, which again was not uncommon. A lot of women who became uh, too influential or powerful, or most notably women, let me rephrase that, women who stepped outside of, of the period's traditional gender roles were generally viewed and eyed with suspicion. And during outbreaks of witch hysteria, they were the prime targets to be accused of witchcraft. So it, it makes sense from a cultural standpoint why Joan would be accused of witchcraft. Uh, and with the Pope's blessing, the English burned Joan at the stake, executing her. However, Joan's, uh, or rather, the, um, the hope that Joan gave to the French lived on. And the French continued pushing the English back until in 1453, the war officially ended when the English army was finally forced from France. And you get to, we get to look at some the effects of the Hundred Years' War. So, <clears throat> in the short term, all English land holdings in France were seized. So, again, the English lost all their land in France. The victory also uh, radically strengthened the French monarchy. And this is a general trend that we'll see following the Hundred Years' War across Europe which we'll look at in a bit more detail uh, going forward. But know that after the war ended, the French king gained greater power. Uh, and this really starts a trend toward what is referred to as absolute monarchy in Europe. Uh, an absolute monarchy, uh, as probably as the name sounds, it literally means a system of government where the king 
has absolute power. The king controls everything. And that trend really starts, at least in France, with the Hundred Years' War, culminating in this guy, King Louis the Sixteenth, or not Louis the Fourteenth. My mistake. Ugh. King Louis the Fourteenth, who is regarded as the most effective absolute monarch of all time, uh, referred to as the Sun King, because. Like the planets revolve around the sun, all of France revolved around Louis XIV. But that's the French side. On the English side, in the short term, the English monarchy was destabilized. But long term, the English king got greater power as well. Uh, but in the immediate aftermath of the Hundred Years' War, because of the instability caused in England by losing this war, and just the, the show of weakness, or how weak this made the English king appear, England entered into the War of the Roses, which was a decades-long fight for control over the throne between two noble families, the Houses of Lancaster and the House of York, eventually culminating in uh, victory for the Lancasters, but... As a show of unity to try and prevent further blood uh, or further, further bloodshed, uh, the Lancasters married into the Yorks, forming the House of Tudor. And beginning with the Tudors, England, the English monarchy starts gaining more power as well. Although notably, the English never really adopt absolute monarchy. Although the king does become more powerful and uh, the English government does become more centralized following the Hundred Years' War, meaning that power uh, resided more in the king and his officials and not with uh, nobles ruling over their own little fiefs. So the long-term effects of the war. Long-term effects of the Hundred Years' War, feudalism is damaged beyond repair. Too many social and political changes have happened that feudalism could no longer effectively continue, especially when these changes are coupled with the changes that happened following the Black Death, notably with the massive economic changes resulting in uh, the peasants gaining more power and uh, the delegit uh, the the loss of legitimacy and respect for the Catholic Church. So long-term effects of the Hundred Years' War, nobles and knights lose power while kings gain power. So uh, as I've already mentioned before, the knights lose power, become obsolete because the longbow changes the way Wars are fought to the point where knights were no longer worth having. They took too long to train, they were too expensive, and they were no longer as effective as they were prior to the introduction of the longbow. Since knights were no longer really in play, the nobility was no longer as important because the king no longer needed the nobles to finance the training and the equipment for or the training and the equipment of knights. And furthermore, since these were massive war efforts, uh, the kings naturally centralized more authority in themselves to better conduct the war. So when the wars were over, the kings kind of just kept that centralized power, hence why the kings gained power. This also starts an important trend where military power, militaries in Western Europe, stop being private. What I mean is that uh, nobles stopped having their own private armies, and instead we see the emergence of large professional armies controlled by the state. So instead of having private militaries or private fighters loyal to a lord, there were large professional armies who were loyal to a king, and more importantly, loyal to a country, to a government. So um, 
with these changes to medieval Europe, feudalism was effectively ended. And we entered into, Europe entered into an age referred to as the age of the monarchs, where you have a lot more power, where the kings have a lot more power, and are taking a lot more direct actions with this power. So, we start to see uh, a transition as well, culturally, out of this into the Renaissance, Europe's rebirth. Uh, and that's pretty cool. And that's what we'll look at after we finish going over the Middle Ages. Uh, so I know this is kind of a lot. Uh, if you have any questions over this, let me know. And uh, I will talk to you later.